Online College Sports Conversations. Bonnie Bernstein, glad to be back with you. And as Black History Month comes to a close, really excited today to shine a light on Presley Anderson. So Presley was team captain for Cal Volleyball, all Pac-12 selection before finishing her career at Baylor. That included a Final Four run. Currently volunteer coaching at TCU. And Presley's work in the social justice space, I think is a great example of how each of us has the ability and the opportunity to leverage the leadership skills we learn as athletes to create real impact beyond the field of play. So Presley, I want to start with the position you played in volleyball because I've always kind of felt that to a certain degree, the, the position you play and the sport you play kind of says something about your personality. You were a middle blocker, typically the tallest player on the court, but what do you see as the connection between Presley, the middle blocker, and Presley, the person? Yeah, um, it's so funny because I think, you know, as much as I say that the middle works the hardest on the court and probably gets the least amount of reward because there's a lot of other things that have to go great in order for the middle to be the shining star. I do think that um, it just says a lot about just me. I'm always one who, regardless of um, how much reward or achievement if I can't see it right then and there I'm still going to do what I have to do for the team around me um, we're typically like the captain of the front row leading the block um, which means you kind of have to have like a more dominant personality being able to tell the teammates to the left and right of you when they're doing something wrong if they're doing something great and so um, again it just goes back to like trying to help the people around you to be great so you're all great but, um, and that's kind of like what I pride myself in is just, I always want to see the people around me being successful. You hear 6'2", and we all automatically think, all right, she's a basketball player or yeah. she's a volleyball player. If you look at the data though, around black female volleyball players though, it's somewhere in the eight to 10% range. Many, many of those women are playing at HBCUs. So why volleyball for you? Um, I actually started to play well, so I played tennis, basketball, soccer for a short period of time, um, pretty much everything under the sun. I tried it all when I was younger. My older sister played volleyball. Um, I would go to her games and I naturally want to do what my older, my cool older sister does. So I just started playing myself. Um, I think those numbers, uh, it's just, it says a lot kind of about um, how expensive the sport is as well. And so I was kind of, um, I was blessed enough where I was able to, my parents could afford to pay for club volleyball, um, which is obviously very expensive. Um, and so I think like, it's, it's really sad to see those numbers, but at the same time, hopefully like with the growth of the sport, more clubs are opening up, um, which means hopefully different prices and more participation in the sport altogether. I mean, I know it's the fastest growing sport and there's like a reason behind it. It's fast paced, it's fun. Um, at the YMCA level, it's super popular. And for me, I just ended up sticking with it beyond YMCA and it worked out for me in the long run. Yeah, you know, we obviously, because this is a Title IX podcast, ask all of our guests on the pod, what does Title IX mean to them? I would imagine that maybe you would frame it a little bit differently because you're not just a female athlete, but you're a black female athlete. So when you sort of wrap your head around, what does title IX mean to me? How do you articulate that? Yeah, I mean, for me, title IX is just um, kind of like the policy that allowed us to like eliminate some of the barriers that kind of said that women are not allowed to be in the same space as men. Um, and then for me to go even farther on that, just like discrimination in general, um, I think being able to be now a coach, obviously, and then, but also like as a player, as a student athlete, I'm, I'm very aware of how this sport is dominated um, by people who do not look like me. Um, I grew up in a pretty uh, white dominant, typical suburb in Chandler, Arizona. And so I know the people around me don't look like me, but that doesn't mean that there's not space for people who look like me or people who uh, people of color in general. Like I think um, the avenue that volleyball has allowed, like just the things that I've gotten from this 
is just like unbelievable. Like I swear I'll be able at the end of my coaching career, I'm going to be able to write a book on all the great people I've met and the cool places I've gone. And to be fair, I just want more people to have that same opportunity. I want people to be able to experience what it's like to be a college athlete because there's now because of Title IX, like there's so many great things that come with that beyond just the success on the volleyball court or in your sport. You know, Presley, you're getting into the social justice space at a really interesting time because I, I feel like there was sort of this for a long time, a moratorium on athletes taking a position on anything that might seem remotely controversial. Legal studies was your major at Cal. And I'm wondering, you know, you're you're biracial, your mom is white, your father is black, your dad was an all-American wrestler at Arizona State. So so you grew up in, in this environment where, to your point, predominantly white neighborhood in Arizona, but do you remember just sort of this pivotal moment in your journey where you're like, this just happened, this has inspired me to take this path of advocacy? Yeah. Yeah, I feel like I've always been super outspoken about things like this because I feel like in my position, being biracial and also in surrounded in a community of people who are white, predominantly white, um, I've always just kind of had this edge to me that has made me super aware of like, okay, this is how I'm different than all of my friends. Um, and it's almost felt like my responsibility to be the person to speak up about it because if I'm what my friends know as Black, like if I'm their representation of Black, like I want to do it to the best of my abilities. I want to, it's not my job to teach them, but if I am able to speak up about things that I feel like are, you know, just generally wrong and it has to do with racism, like I will gladly say something. Um, were you now doing that, means, that even before college? Would you, are there instances yes. that you can recall in, in high school and in, in middle school where you wanted to take that position? Yeah, I mean, I almost feel like, I mean, a lot of it just has to do with the way that I grew up. Like uh, my dad made sure that we understood how privileged of a life we were living and how it's not always like that for people who look like me and how privileged I am just to be whiter, whiter than most, whiter than my dad. Um, it, it's given me privileges that I can't even like explain. But that being said, I am still black and I am still proud of that part of me that makes me who I am. Um, and I understand that um, a lot of people have it way worse than I do. But if I feel like if I do, if people are willing to listen to me, then I wanna have something really good to say. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's interesting when I think about where you went to school, you go to Cal, which is yeah. really one of the most progressive schools in America, and Baylor, who interestingly enough, President Linda Livingstone played hoops at Oklahoma State, recently inducted into the school's Hall of Fame, was just elected yeah. as chair of the NCAA's Board of Governors. How do you feel that playing at two really high profile universities has helped you amplify your voice in the social justice space? Yeah, um, I am like so, so grateful for my decision to attend both schools. I mean, I think I got two completely different experiences and that's like not, um, in that's what not something that that's not, well, in many ways. Um, first of all, like obviously I was living in a big city in California, you know, uh, pretty outwardly progressive at Cal or the education there was just like, insanely intense like I I genuinely felt like I was getting Ivy League education um and so I'm like super grateful for like even the relationships I made with my professors the conversations I was able to have there um in the legal studies department like it really helped just per offer perspective that you know I maybe wouldn't have been able to get elsewhere and then on the Give me an example plan. of that. Like, do you remember a particular conversation with a professor that made the light bulb go off or or some sort of anecdote that you can share on that front? Yeah. Um, one of my professors um for this law and humanitarians class that I took, 
he kind of provided some insight just kind of actually as he knew I was an athlete and so he kind of provided some insight on some of his thoughts regarding um, sexual harassment cases happening in college athletics, um, how it can happen, you know, at any university and depending on how much money or whatever, it can just get swept on the, under the rug. Um, so that just got brought up just because of a, a piece that we were working on for the class, some sort of essay or something. We're just supposed to be writing about something in the law that's like meaningful to us. And so it was interesting um obviously I was thinking about going to law school for a while that's why I did I chose legal studies as my route and I still am considering law school at some point down the road just right now my focus is in coaching and so I think he kind of knew that that I was going to be in the sports world and there's like a lot of pieces in college athletics that should be brought to light and he knew how vocal I was as a student and so I think he was just kind of like this is what you can do with your education. If you're educated about it, how you can speak up some committees that you can look at. Um, and so like that was kind of like the conversation, conversations with him um, that kind of made me feel like there's a lot more than playing volleyball or coaching volleyball that I can do to help raise awareness on some big issues happening both in college athletics or behind the scenes. I, I get the impression that George Floyd's death was a real big trigger for you, not just to speak about the importance of social justice, but to actually do something about it. Can you yeah. reflect back on your decisions and your actions during that time? Because that was during the pandemic. So I'm assuming that you were home with your family in Arizona, right? Yes. Yes. Um, I was home in Arizona and... Um, yeah, I mean, I honestly get chills just thinking about it. Uh, that really was like the first time where I felt, I felt overwhelmed for something that like almost had nothing to, it almost felt like it was like, it had nothing to do with me. It didn't directly impact me. You know, I wasn't hurting. I wasn't the one who thankfully like what, well, I'm not a relative of George Floyd, but it just, it was a, it cut a deep wound into my heart. And it was a conversation that me and my family had talked about. And it started a conversation that we had kind of always been having in my household, just about racism in the United States, what my brothers or us, my sisters, me and my sisters are supposed to do when we get pulled over by cops. You know, what it looks like um, when we go into, how we're supposed to act and talk and in job interview application. I mean, my parents have hit everything under the sun of how they can prepare us to avoid um, having to deal with discrimination and stuff, but to see it so like, just so in our faces when the George Floyd thing happened, it was like, it was something like my parents knew like we couldn't avoid talking about. And so for me and my siblings, like we would have little conversations on the side, we would do check-ins with each other. Um, and me and my older brother actually went to um, a peaceful protest around that time with a group of our friends. Um, and it was super important. Um, my dad made it super clear, like, he wanted us to be safe you know this is like what we can expect because my dad participated in peaceful protests when he was in college and so for him he was like proud of us for doing what we felt so strongly about and even if the march marching for, on behalf of george floyd and the incident that happened like it might have not felt like a big deal but like that really was like what sparked me continuing the conversation on social media specifically. You not only participated in peaceful protest, but you did something which I think is so important and so powerful and so helpful in any sort of circumstance where we're trying to heal. And that is that you wrote. You wrote a beautiful poem called Chains. Um, I asked you about this ahead of time, so I'm going to expect that you did your homework assignment and you pulled up the poem. Yes. Uh, are, are you open to reading a portion of the poem that when you reflect back on it a couple of years later, 
still really resonates with you? I will read my favorite part of the poem. Um, I'll just read the little bit that I feel like a lot of people kind of gave me nods on that they felt like meant something to them. Um, I just want to preface this. I do not typically write things like this, but I obviously felt compelled to do so because it did make me super emotional at the time. And I felt the best way um, to do something with my emotions was to just put it to paper. Um, so yeah, I'll just read a little piece of it, like one of my favorite parts. Um, okay. Prove to them that white silence is oppression. Prove to them that success can come from the poor neighborhoods the government refuses to acknowledge. Prove to them that peaceful protests may not be enough, but powerful ones will make the noise, the noise that we need to make change. Show them that LeBron James, Tiger Woods, and Serena Williams are one of us. And if they don't want one of us, they can't have any of us. We can't be your entertainment and shooting target too. None of our people deserve this, the chains they chose to keep us from being too powerful. Yeah, that's that's my little bit that I wrote. Um, yeah, I just feel like uh, one of the bigger conversations that I know personally, um, and I've like had many conversations with my friends about this is like how some of like the best athletes and like some of the greatest like role models in this world, they're black. And like, I think that they're celebrated in a way where, you know, we put them on a platform and like, it's, it's amazing to have idols of people who look like me who are, you know, even have, are more darker, have a darker complexion than me. Um, but that being said, I think Conversely, I think the people who are also black and maybe don't have the athletic ability of a LeBron, of a Tiger Woods, of a Serena Williams, like they're still people too. And I think to just disregard them, like the, the thing that racism does is it just kind of disregards them as being lesser than um, just because we're not able to watch them on Sunday night football or just because we can't watch them in the finals, you know? So I think it's like so amazing that we have these idols, but I think the contrast to that is just like not allowing a typical black person to be subject to just the discrimination and racism that are clearly still happening today. For sure. And um, you bring up an interesting point in that, whether you are an athlete or a coach or um, you know a grocery store checkout clerk or a UPS driver, we all have a right to yeah. share our opinions. And that leads me to an area where I, I think you'd be able to give a lot of sage wisdom. So I took a look at your Twitter profile. And one of the things I noticed is that you don't do a lot of original tweeting sharing your mm -hmm. personal opinion but what you do do is that um you share retweets um yeah. about how the day after title nine roe v wade was overturned or the verdict in the johnny depp and amber heard case and i'm wondering if that's by design because we always hear the quote retweets are not endorsements but i i kind of get the impression that in your case it is mm -hmm. and is your approach a byproduct of conversations you've had um, where you have been, it's been suggested to you that you gotta be careful about expressing your own opinion, but also representing a brand. And in your case, it's the, whatever university you're playing or coaching for. Right. Yeah, I think it's it's so interesting because I will just, I won't even think about it. If, I, if there's a tweet that I like and that I've like, obviously like want to align myself with I'll just retweet it I won't even think about it but for me to actually like script out something I feel like I would have to be so specific in my wording um in the way that just in the way that the tweet presents itself or could be interpreted um which is kind of why I choose to retweet is because the typically the the things that I'm retweeting pretty much 100% of the time, I prefer their word choice, whether it's negative or positive or neutral, like 
I retweet it because I, I want to align myself with the way that they present the information. And if people were to go on my profile, I met, talked to you about this a little bit, but like, I want my social media to be a representation of who I am. And so if that means clicking on my profile and all you see are volleyball highlights, wrote something about Roe v. Wade, something about, you know, George Floyd, whatever it may be, whatever, whatever is on my profile is what I would say. Someone has just done, done me the service of already saying it for me. Um, so yeah, I, I think that you do really have to be careful with what you put out there. Obviously so many, so many people are under scrutiny because of, because they will just get super emotional and super reactive and they'll just tweet whatever they want. And then it's out there for the world to see. For me, I'm going through and I'm kind of just selecting the little bits and pieces that I feel super passionate about that I wouldn't mind typing myself. Um, so yeah, one I- One of the student I, athletes you're coaching, if, <laughs> if one of the student athletes comes to you who you're coaching and they say, Coach Anderson, um, social justice is really important to me. I want to be able to leverage my social platform to- uh, share my voice, how can I, or should I do this? What does that conversation look like in the context of, you know, the, the bigger picture and the bigger picture is, as I mentioned, you're playing for a university or you're working for a university or maybe somebody in a different scenario is working for a company. And we know that no matter how much we may say retweets or not endorsements or however we position that. The fact of the matter is, if you say something that creates controversy, it may very well come back and reflect on your employer, your university, your fill in the blank. So if a student athlete came to you and say, coach, yeah. what do I do? What do you tell them? I would say that there's nothing you could ever post about when it comes to standing up in a social justice matter, discrimination, whatever it may be, regardless of how controversial it may seem, like at the end of the day, there's right and there's wrong. And if you feel really, honestly, like compelled to say something to all of your followers on social media, knowing that you have a platform, knowing that it could cause controversy, like, I think more power to you because we need more people who are willing to say, like, this is not normal or like, this is not okay. Because the only way for us to like actually get rid of an, an incident is to let people, more people know that this is not okay. So, I mean, I, I, I'm not like by any means have a super large following. I'm not, I'm, I don't have a blue check mark. I, I just kind of have put myself in a position where I have followers from Arizona now, California and Texas area. So a big part of, of where I've been, I've obviously gained traction of followers. And so to me, I'm like, if now it seems like I'm, I'm letting people know in three different states, I have at least three different states of people following me where I'm like, okay, this is like, if this could gain traction, like my poem that I posted, if something like this can gain traction, then I feel like I'm doing my part and standing up for what I believe in and using my platform that has touches at least 5,000 people on, on Instagram and letting them know like, this is not okay. And I'm proud to say that. Coaching is such a great way for you, Presley, to pay it forward, whether it's on the social justice front, whether it's on the gender equity front. I think mm -hmm. you got to TCU after the 50th, the official 50th anniversary of Title yeah. IX back in June. But I'm curious, I feel like with all of these student athlete advisory councils, more and more of them have subcommittees on diversity and equity and inclusion. And I'm curious what sort of conversations you've had with the girls you're coaching about gender equity in Title IX. Yeah, so actually, luckily enough, um, our Black, uh, who's Smiley Manyang, who's a Black out, uh, right side outside hitter on our team, is the president of SAC for TCU which is just so cool that we have um, one of our own as like leading the way in SAC. 
Um, and she says that they've had a few conversations and meetings and whatnot. I know something that that was important was they got little Title IX patches that they were able to wear on their jersey. And so even though it's like super simple, it's just, it at least is represents, if we want, again, it just goes back to like representation, like in the same way that like your jersey has your name, your number and your school you're from, like it also has a little piece of Title IX that shows like this is something serious to us. And in that same breath, we obviously have the Big 12, uh, diversity or unity and diversity statement that's said at the beginning of every game that I actually was able to have a piece in editing um, on behalf of TCU Volleyball just so we could submit something. I was able to look at the wording. Again, I just want to make sure that we're hitting all the marks and that this is what we represent. This is what's going to be said at the beginning of, of every game. So it's clear to every fan, every TCU athletics fan or an opponent that like, this is what we stand behind and we will not fall below this standard of promoting diversity, promoting a inclusion because it's obviously super important to me but more importantly important to TCU important to the big 12 as a whole sure and you know on a on a macro level you're you're pretty active on social on talking about the growth of women's volleyball I know that it was yeah. a big deal in your community yeah. that Louisville Kentucky back in mid-September last year was mm -hmm. just the fourth time in 25 years that a regular season volleyball match was on ESPN. So if, if I'm asking you to assess where women's volleyball is on a glass half full or glass half empty scale, where do you land there? Yeah, no, I'm definitely, I'm definitely glass half full all the way. I am just thrilled again to see the participation and numbers just increase for the sport it is such a fun sport to play it's such a fun sport to watch and like now being able to coach it like I I can only imagine in 10 years how more popular the sport will be and something that's actually really important for me um is coaching club I've coached clubs since I was like a junior in high school so for at least like seven or eight years now I've been very active I coached my little sister's club team last year which was actually like so much fun um but it's really important to acknowledge like how popular this sport is is getting and what benefits can come if more and more of these girls are gonna be d1 athletes be ncaa athletes not even just division one but at any level playing collegiate sports is like truly amazing and like i said i've been able to just kind of uh, take, I mean, take advantage of honestly, so many of my resources and connections that I've made along the way, which is like why I'm like so happy to coach now. Um, so I think that the growth of our sport, like for it to be on ESPN is like, it's, it's huge. And it's honestly just the beginning. And I'm like excited to see how we can get more and more matches on ESPN because I know there are people who want to watch volleyball. We just have to make sure that the viewership is, we're letting ESPN basically know through viewership, like, hey, this is a great sport and we just, we deserve to be, we deserve to be in the same arena as the men in terms of, uh, in terms of watching it and coverage and stuff. Well, I'm sure there are going to be so many female athletes who listen to this podcast, Presley, and will be inspired to get more involved in the gender equity space and the show yeah. this space. And I want to talk about opportunities that you might suggest as we get ready to wrap up here. And one of them was an internship that you did with an organization called Voice in Sports, which is an advocacy mm -hmm. for female athletes. What resonated most with you about that experience? Yeah, um, so I started doing voice and sport. This was um, a little bit, I guess, over two years at this point, but it was this great short internship that I did where I got to connect with other female athletes, um, other collegiate female athletes. And then now it's expanded to the high school level, level where they have advocates at high schools. Um, and basically it's just trying to, it's just a representation of how, 
great Title IX is and how, but still how much more work there is to be done in the gender equity space, in the discrimination space. And Voice in Sports gives the platform to female athletes to be able to say like, this is my, to share their stories, to post on their Instagrams, letting people know like, I'm an, a Voice in Sport advocate. This is what I can do for you. Um, and kind of like represent their community, both for their sport, for their team, for their sport, for their university. Um, it's, re it's really cool what they're doing. And it was really inspiring to me as well, because obviously I was doing this uh, around COVID time, around George Floyd time. There was a lot of things going on. And so for me, it's like super important just to find little ways um, like that internship to just be more involved and find find honestly more efficient ways to, to continue to amplify my voice and others around me who are like-minded uh, when it comes to dealing with Title IX, discrimination, gender equity, things like that. When I, when I hear your voice and when I see your energy and your passion, I can't help but think of Flo Hyman. I'm a little bit older than you, but yeah. you know, she was an iconic black volleyball player, civil rights advocate, mm -hmm. earned the first women's scholarship in that sport at Houston, led the national team to silver in 1984, testified on Capitol Hill about advancing Title IX. I hope you know you have power with your voice, Presley, to have impact just like she did. So um, I just wanna say thank you for taking time out of your day to spend with us, to share your story. And thank you for being an inspiration. And thanks to you, all of you who joined us on this episode of Title IX College Sports Conversations. You can see all of these episodes on the NCAA YouTube channel. Presley, look forward to following your journey. And for all of you watching, look forward to seeing you again next time. Thanks so much, Bonnie.